Good morning, everyone. Happy Independence Day. And uh, today we'll end our series entitled Keywords in the Christian Life. And uh, as I've told you last time, that this is a study of some of the beautiful words in the Bible. That if we understand these words, we already understand what the Bible teaches. But if we don't understand these words, then we have missed the whole message of the Bible itself. So as a review, I hope that you've been, you have grown in your knowledge of your salvation and what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross. So as a, a perhaps a quiz, may I will give you some uh, phrases or terms, and then let's identify what keyword is that, okay? Can we flash on screen the first word? All the words, okay. Slave market, what is that keyword wherein you uh, purchase you know, a slave? Uh, redemption, okay, redemption. Now the mercy seat, that's the lid on top of the tabernacle and you pour the blood so that the Lord is satisfied by that uh, offering. Propitiation, okay? And then living room, once they were enemies, but now they are friends with God. We are friends with God. Reconciliation. And courtroom? Justified. Justification. And today we're going to study adoption, that we are, uh, we have been brought into God's family. Let us pray. Lord, we just thank you for just moving, oh God, all of us and bringing us here. And we just ask, Lord, that you open the eyes of our hearts that we'll understand you more. And we'll appreciate, Lord, what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, that this will have a deeper meaning on us. Lord, I pray also that you empower me. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, so next Sunday we'll have a sermon series uh, break, and we'll talk about the strong Christian and the weak Christian and overcoming a judgmental spirit. So just imagine with me that you were born in a family that is poverty-stricken and uh, dysfunctional, that uh, your parents don't really even care about your welfare, your well-being, and that this family has no hopes or prospects for the future. And then all of a sudden, a wealthy man comes along, kind and gentle, and he offers no, he tells you how much he loves you, and he offers his home that you be with him. And he, you, he will give you, you take my name, he says, you take my name, and take an equal share of the wealth, of the inheritance that I'll give to you. Is that uh, possible? Well, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, that what, that's what happened when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. When we placed our trust in Him, we have been brought into God's family. We've been, we have been adopted into His family. So our text this morning, Apostle Paul tells us that <coughs> if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have been adopted and you uh, have equal rights and privileges of a natural born son or child. And there are three things that I would like for us to know again. First, it's, uh, let us rejoice in our adoption that we see in verses 14 to 15. Okay, And that, verse 14 says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. We have a new family. According to Paul, when we were saved, we are called children of God, sons and daughters of God. For those who have received and believe in his name, he has given the right to be called children of God. You're a son, you're a daughter of God, and no court can take that away from you. That's what John 1.12 says. You have been removed from the family of Adam and transplanted into the family of God. No, I, Isaiah 43, 1 says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Second Corinthians 6, 18, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. Now, if you wonder how God feels <coughs> about you, and what does he call you? 
check out First John chapter 3, verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. That's what we are. Now, notice with me in verse uh, uh, 14, it says, led, the phrase, led by the Spirit of God. The, the Greek word there for led means to uh, show the way, to guide. So the Holy Spirit is given to us by God to guide us, to lead us, to show us the way. Now, while the Holy Spirit certainly leads us in a specific or personalized way, I would like for you to know, first and foremost, that the Holy Spirit have changed the trajectory of our lives. From that, going down to the abyss, the path of going down to the abyss, now we are in that way following the path of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit is at work in all of us, comforting us, convicting us, controlling us. Not only that we have a new family, we have a new father. That's what verse 15 says. Okay, Verse 15 tells us that we have been delivered from the bondage of fear and that we have been now adopted into the family of God. What is adoption? Many Christians don't realize that adoption is a profoundly biblical concept. Now, allow me to read to you the definition of adoption according to a Wikipedia article. Adoption is the legal act of, of permanently placing a child with a parent or parents other than the birth parents. Adoption results in the severing of the parental responsibilities and rights of the biological parents and the placing of those responsibilities and rights onto the adoptive parents. After the finalization of the adoption, there is no legal difference between biological and adopted children. Now, the Greek word for adoption means to place as a son within a family with full family privileges as an adult member of the family. That's the background of uh, Paul's thought in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. Allow me to read those verses. <coughs> verses 1 and 2, what I am saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, the heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. Verses 1 and 2 describe to us a common situation in the first, centu in first century. Imagine a father who is so wealthy and he has a son who is a minor. Now the verse or the verses are telling us that this son as a minor, he, un until he reaches that age wherein the father has set him free, he will be treated no differently as a slave. He has no more rights than a slave. Did you get that? That this adopt or this son who is a minor, although he would inherit the vast wealth of his father, but as long as he is still a minor, he would be treated as a slave until the time that his father decides to set him free. Are you with me? Now, talking about inheritance, I ran across this uh, article wherein a man was rushed to the hospital. He had cardiac arrest, but he survived. And the doctor had strict orders of only one visitor a day, and he should not get excited. Now, while in the hospital, this man, his uncle, a very rich uncle, died. And he left him 100 million pesos. Now, the family, they gathered and said, how can we break that news with the least amount of excitement? So they called, they decided, they called their pastor, Pastor Poggy. And so when pastor came and they told him about this, oh, that's easy, I'll be the one, I'll take care of that. I will break the news to him. And so when he visited him in the ICU, the, the, the sick man said, oh, pastor, thank you for praying for me. Well, they had their pleasantries, and then the pastor began you know, breaking the news. He said, he asked, if 
you will receive 100 million pesos today. What will you do with the money? Oh, pastor, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm old already. I'll give 70% to the church and 20% to you. And the pastor dropped dead of cardiac arrest. <laughs> well, kwentong kuchero. Verses 3 and 4, uh, these verses describe to us also what God did when he sent his son to redeem, no? to redeem those who are under the law and also that they would receive the full rights of sons. Now, full rights, brothers and sisters in Christ, means that here we remember the slave, the son, and then in his proper timing at the set time, God sent his son so that we would be set free from slavery. All right? Now, redeem. We studied that last Sunday, redemption. You pay the price so as to set someone free. Now, for example, you went to the slave market, and then you took pity on a slave, and then paid the price for his freedom. Now, while he was on his way, you talked to him and told him, you know, would you be, I am opening my home for you. Take my name, and I will also give you an equal share of my inheritance. All you have to do, all you have to do is come with me and consent to be one of my children. Is that possible? That's what happened when we place our trust on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word, the word there is uh, full rights. You know what does it mean? The full rights? No matter how bad you were, no matter how worse you were, no matter how deep your sin is before your conversion, God has brought you into his home. There is no stepchild or second-class child of God. Are you with me? Did you get that? So when God, you know, he redeemed us, he set us free, and then he brought us into his family. He purchased us from the slavery of sin. He brought us into his family and gave us full rights. Full rights as his own children. We come in as full members of the family with rights and privileges to those who have been there 30, 40, or 50 years. We can pray. We can claim God's promises on the same basis as those, of, of those who have come ahead of us. Those who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior perhaps 30, 40, 50 years ago. That, my friend, is what verses 3 and 4 and 5 are saying. Okay? The concept. So where did Paul get this concept of adoption? He didn't get it from the Old Testament law. Or all, he didn't get it from the Old Testament. Because the word adoption, that word didn't occur in the Old Testament. There was you know, some allusions, possible allusions to adoption. For example, Moses in Exodus. And then Esther in the book of Esther. But you must remember that these took place, these events took place outside of Israel. It took place outside of Israel. Jewish law, under Jewish law, it, uh, legal adoption wasn't prescribed. It wasn't even practiced in Israel. Therefore, there were no legal adoptions or legal adoption wasn't enacted when Moses or Esther no, was adopted. That's why Old Testament law no adoption. So where did he get this? He was not referring to the Old Testament. He was referring to who? the Roman law of his day. Okay? The Roman law of his day. Wealthy, childless couples would practice adoption so that their wealth would be transferred to their adopted child. They would buy a slave in the slave market, bring him to her, their home, so that their wealth would be transferred to another generation. 
Roman adoption was always rendered serious and difficult because of the Roman law of patria potestas. We discussed this last year. Patria potestas is the power of the father or the father's power. He has absolute power over his family. He has power over the life and death of his family. He has absolute power of dispos disposal and control. Now, I've already told you that even when he killed his children, if the father kills his children, he wouldn't be liable. He wouldn't be punished. It would not be a crime. That's patria potest potestas in their time. <coughs> and in regard to that, a Roman son could never come of age. He would always still be under the authority the parental authority of his father. Patria potestas. For example, he's already seven, this Roman son is 70 years old and his father is still alive at 92. He will still be under the authority of his father. He will still be under patria potestas. So you see now the difficulty here. If a man would like to adopt someone, but this boy has a father who is under patria potestas, it would be difficult. To adopt a son in the Roman law, unless he was illegitimate or an orphan, it would be very hard. He would go through a process, a process that he would pass out from under the patria potestas, that baby or that boy would be into his control. There are two steps. One is what we call Mancipatio, or it's pronounced Mancipatio. Uh, Italian, Mancipatio. Mancipatio is where we get the word emancipation. Okay? There will be a symbolic transaction, a symbolic sale. And they use scales and copper. Now, the father would sell his son twice, and then he would buy him back. The third time, he would sell him, and then he would not buy him back. In that manner, they, the Patria Potestas law has been broken. And the second step would be Mancipatio. No, Mancipatio is the ceremony. He would go to the Roman magistrate, the one who, the adoptive father, and present the documents and all these things, and there would be a legal transference of that adopted person to him, that he would be under now patria potestas to his adoptive father. Okay? And when all this was complete, the adoption was already done. Now, this is important. These four main consequences. One, the adopted person lost all rights in his own family and gained all rights in his new family. You see? He gained all the rights of a fully legitimate son in his new family. Second, he became full heir to his new father's estate even if there were other sons or if other sons were afterward born into the family who were real blood relations, it would not affect his right of progenitor, his right to be the primary one. Therefore, he was inalienably identified an heir to his new family. And third, according to Roman law, the old life of the adopted person was completely wiped out. Now, this is important. If that adoptive, adopted person has debts, they will all be canceled. If he had crimes, that would be abolished. Everything would be wiped out as if he didn't exist, as if he wasn't born. All right? And the adopted person will be regarded as a new person entering a new life without his past. And fourth, in the eyes of the Roman law, the adopted person was literally and absolutely the son of his new father in every sense. Now, when you think of our adoption into the family of God that way, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that amazing? Our past life has been obliterated. 
wiped out, blotted out. We are absolutely and literally children of God. That's where Apostle Paul got the concept of adoption. So let us rejoice in our adoption. That's why now I'm, I'm sure you have understood that fact that when we are in Christ, everything of our, our past, we are a new creation, a new creature. Because of that adoption. Not only that we must rejoice, we must also revel in our assurance in verse 16. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Not only that we have been adopted into the family of God, we have been given the priceless assurance of this wonderful fact in our hearts day by day by day. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. It assures us if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit that is in you assures you of that relationship. Why? Because there is the communion with the Spirit. <coughs> The Spirit says, the Spirit Himself, the Spirit Himself, you know, it is very emphatic. The Spirit is a person. It's not an inanimate object. It's not a power. It's not some kind of a Star Wars force. He is a person. And we are given this objective truth in the scripture that if we have been saved, if we have accepted Jesus by faith, then we are children of God. We are brought into the family of God. One example in 1 John 5.13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. If you go back a few verses, it would say there that it is not just in our heads, it is also in our hearts. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. And according to 1 John chapter 4, verse 13, one of the roles of the Spirit is to assure us of the certainty of our salvation. We know that we live in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. The child of God has been blessed, brothers and sisters in Christ, with the Holy Communion with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God spends time with the redeemed. And we should not take this for granted. He leads us. He comforts us. He controls us. He convicts us. And He teaches us everything that we need to know how to live our lives for the glory of God. Not only that we are in communion with the Spirit, that is our confidence. The Spirit of God has fellowship with the saved. And it is one of the surest ways that you would know that you have been or you are a born-again Christian. If you are genuinely saved, you will know it because the Spirit of God communes with you and that gives us the confidence. The Spirit speaks to our heart. The Holy Spirit tells us of things, teaches us of truth. He comforts us. He convicts us. He leads us. Now, if the Holy Spirit doesn't talk to you, if the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to your heart, except, except, you might not have been saved in the first place. Like a mother who wraps her arms around her insecure child and offers her undying love, that's what the Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is the lover, the divine lover of our soul. And lastly, not only that we rejoice in our adoption, and because of that, the Holy Spirit assures us of our relationship with Him, now we enjoy the abundance, the blessing. No? We are wealthy beyond Measure. That's what verse 17 says. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Not only that we have been adopted into the family of God, we have been assured by the Spirit 
of our relationship, now the blessing. We are wealthy beyond measure. The privilege, we are heirs, heirs of God. The verse teaches us that we are wealthy. That since we have been adopted into the family of God, and may I remind you that our Father is wealthy beyond measure. That's what the Bible says. Psalm 50 says, He owns everything. And we are given this wonderful privilege of sharing in that wealth of our Father. That's why Philippians 4.19 means so much to us that no matter uh, <coughs> what our need is, He is able to give it to us. What He has belongs to us. That's Luke 12.32. Not only that is our privilege, we have also our portion. We are co-heirs with Christ. Not only that we are heirs of God, we have been made co-heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Like, you know, literally we are given an equal share in the wealth of the Father. Under Jewish law, the, the eldest son is given a double share of the wealth of the Father. But in Roman law, all the sons are treated equally are treated equally. Then the promise. We share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Yes, as we pass through this life, we will face difficult situations or circumstances. And we will face many trials. There will be days, there will be nights that you will cry out to him, Lord, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? Lord, where are you? There would be times that you would really ask God, Lord, it is as if that you are not answering my needs the way we should think, the way we think that he should. But let me remind you that we are just pilgrims and strangers in this world. The fullness of our inheritance will be realized when we reach our home there in our Father's house. And then we will realize how rich we are and how rich we were. Brothers and sisters in Christ, adoption guarantees the following seven things to every believer. You are a full member of God's family. If you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, pauli tulit, you have been you are a full member of God's family. Second, you have full rights and privileges in heaven. And three, you have immediate access to God. Fourth, you belong to his family. You bear his name. Fifth, you have a full share in the inheritance that he promises his children. And seven, Satan has no claim over you. Because you are no longer a part of his family and you are no longer, or, or Satan is no longer your father. Brothers and sisters in Christ, not only when you accepted Jesus, you have been adopted, assured, and then the assurance that we are also worthy beyond measure. We have a new family, a new father. And let me end that you have also a new function. When God, what God says to any believer, He says it to every believer. The same Holy Spirit that was given to the senior citizen Christian is the same Spirit that has been given to the newest Christian. You can never say, I don't like to read the Bible because I'm a new Christian. You can never say, I don't want to pray because I am a new convert. You can never say, I cannot testify about Christ. There are other Christians who have been there for a long time. Let them do that. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that's not an excuse. God won't accept those lame excuses. And there is only one theological word, again, when we talk about you not say not wanting to pray, not wanting to read the Bible, not wanting to witness. What's the theological word? Where? 
Because what God says to all His children or to one of His children, He says to all of His children. The responsibility that is laid on one is also the same responsibility that is laid on us all. God doesn't give anything to the oldest Christian that He doesn't give to the newest Christian. The moment you come <coughs> to Jesus Christ, all the resources of heaven are put in your disposal. Can we say amen to that? Brothers and sisters in Christ, again, the moment that you come to Jesus Christ, all the resources of heaven are put in your disposal. What does that, what does that mean? You are already rich beyond measure. Therefore, do not live like a pauper and learn to give generously. You already have the Holy Spirit. Don't live in the flesh. You have brothers and sisters in Christ. Learn to lean on them. You have spiritual gifts. Every one of us. Put them to work for Christ. Use them to edify the church. For His glory. You have been set free from the power of Satan. Don't mess with the devil anymore. You have a new family. Stop living like you belong to your old one. Brothers and sisters in Christ, biblical adoption is only possible because God is willing to add more children to his family. What a wonderful thought. It's one of the sweetest thoughts that ever occurred to me. On earth, on earth, adoption gives you a new name, a new identity, a new home, right? A new address. A new history. The same is true in spiritual adoption. You're given a new name, a new home, a new history, a new address, a new identity. Our Heavenly Father, He is our true Father because He has chosen us. And now He has brought us into His family. Whenever we come to Him, He says, Welcome. Welcome, my child. You are always welcome. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have finished those five words. Justification, propitiation, reconciliation, redemption, adoption. By now, I hope that you have learned a lot and you have appreciated what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross because those five words have brought us back to what Jesus did on the cross. And it is this, O oh Lord, that I pray that as we go through the highest form of worship, which is the celebration of the Lord's Supper, I pray that you will recommit your life to Him and that you will, un because you have understood and appreciated what He has done, oh, it's my prayer that we will have more volunteers in the church because they want to serve, because you want to serve God. May I ask everyone to please close their eyes and may you take this time to appreciate what the Lord has done on to you. How He has declared you not guilty. He declared you righteous. And because of that, you can even call Him Abba, Father, Daddy. And then, you know, the, He sent His Son to die on the cross and that blood Jesus has been has become the high priest and also the sacrifice that had been offered up to him and Jesus was satisfied he was propitiated by that act and because of that anyone who comes to him before you were at war with God, you were an enemy of God. And because you have accepted and believed in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done to you, then you become or reconciled with God. He, Jesus Christ redeemed you.
with his precious blood. And because of all these things, brothers and sisters in Christ, you are now adopted into the family of God. Your past has been erased, has been obliterated, has been wiped out, that you can have a new life in him. Who am I, oh God, that you have done this for me? The worst of all sinners. Lord, thank you. And because of this, I recommit my life to you. Would you please move mightily, O God, in this church that they will really see what you've done and appreciate, O God, the salvation that has been offered to them. Yes, they have accepted this, Lord, but please, Lord, don't make them stay the way they are. Or perhaps some are carnal Christians, Lord. Would you forgive them, O God? Lord, move mightily in this congregation. Help us, Lord.